making music, not just playing exercises, being in control of what you're doing. Do it, handle it. That's what we're gonna do today. You're gonna get it down, you're gonna learn it, you're gonna learn what I say and you're gonna live it. Before we can start, we've got to make sure we're in tune, so I'm going to give you an A chord. All right, let's go. One thing I think you should all be able to do is hear a chord progression in your head without it being there and solo over it and following the chords really strictly in your head is going to develop your your mental ability to hear chords even if they're not there and you really have to develop that so you can play in an ensemble or band situation because the whole idea is to make your melodies work you have to really care about what goes on under them those being the chords or chord progressions that you're using so what I want to do is uh, first I'm going to start with just holding an E note down and I'm going to solo over it and then you're going to hear the progression through my soloing, you're going to hear the chord progression. I'll play the chord progression that's in my mind first. What we're going to do is hold down an E, but I'm going to be playing along to a progression that sounds like this. Okay, I'm going to make it really obvious what chords I'm playing over by the soloing. So like, you can almost hear the progression through the melodies that I'm playing and make it really obvious to you what's going on here. Okay, so check it out. Okay, I was kind of arpeggiating a lot on there, and that's pretty much the easiest way to follow a chord, is to arpeggiate it. it. You really can't go wrong if you do that, because all the notes that are in the chord that you're following are there, and you, if you play correctly, you're going to wind up right. So now I'm going to try that same thing with the chords behind it, and you'll hear that it's basically the same kind of soloing going on. So the rhythm is like this. You're probably wondering what's going on through my mind besides probably food or something like that while I'm soloing like that and you have to consciously think of the chords really hard that are happening under your soloing and I'm gonna give you some examples of what I might do over those three chords you have to know what you want to do over the chords as they're playing so the more you do this the more you'll get a feel of you know the process but this is broken down what is actually going on. So I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold each chord. I only use three chords in this whole thing. It was E, D, and A. And uh, since it's such a simple progression, I really want to make the differences of each chord stand out more because they're so basic and they're so commonly heard together 
the more I can emphasize the fact that it's a chord change in my soloing, the better it is and the more unique and different it's going to sound. So let's see all the things that we can do over each chord. So what I might do to start out with is like arpeggiate something like... like an E major arpeggio, and that gives me a, a lot of room to figure out what to do. Okay, I'm also bearing in mind, you know, that there's a D coming up and there's an A coming up, so those are notes that are sort of a target note that I'm gonna wind up hitting soon, you know, so if I keep that in mind as I'm playing the E chord, I'll be more prepared for the next chord that comes, which would be D. safe with an arpeggio of a chord, you know. Okay, and then the next chord that's coming up is A. So I did a lot of stuff around this position here. What I'm going to do now is like I'm going to kind of talk while the progression is going on. I'm going to explain where my target notes are as the chords are happening. And this is what's going on through my mind and what you should be sort of thinking of as the chords are flying by. So what I'm going to do is have the progression go by. I'll show you what's going on in my head. We'll do it really slow this time so we can get an idea of what's happening. Gotta do something for E now. Right about now I start thinking of D. Give me a little break. The more I sustain, the more time I have to think about the next chord. Gotta get to E. tip is the longer you sustain on the notes, that the notes, that's going to give you your time to breathe and your time to follow the next chord and not to give away the fact that you don't know what you're doing, okay? And uh, basically that's what you're trying to do usually is sound like you know what you're doing. And the more sustaining you do, you're giving yourself that chance. It's like if I'm holding E, uh oh here comes D, I better get ready to follow it. So sometimes when you have a lack of ideas, you just got to slow down. And that's when you got the time to figure out what the chord is next and what you're going to do over it. And uh, a lot of guys, uh, you know, they think they got to be playing more, you know, but sometimes if you land on the right note at the right time, people are going to think you're a genius, you know. So just stopping is going to give you that option, you know. Wow, I got some time to think of what I'm going to do next. And uh, the more you think, the better you're going to play. That, that should be a quote somewhere, you know. The more you think, the better you're going to play. Now I'm going to play over the progression kind of in a normal way, just uh, just staying in the key of E somewhat. And uh, this is a pretty basic way that most guys would follow this. And it sounds fine, but if you want to develop any originality, the more that you follow the chords, the more you're going to have a choice in what your solo ends up sounding like, you know, because anybody can master a key and play it over a chord changes like that, and that's great. But if you follow each chord, chances are you're not going to follow all the chords the same as another guitarist. You know, you're going to have your own little quirks. And, you know, the more you follow chords, the more those quirks are going to stand out. And that's what you're playing and originality is made out of. The way you do the things you do. <laughs> great song title. But um, here's the progression.
Here's what I would do in the same situation. Sometimes when I'm arpeggiating the chords, you might be noticing that I'm not arpeggiating the exact name of the chord that's going on, or I might, you know, break it up some way. A relative chord is sometimes nicer part of it, like say for the key of E, a relative chord would be D flat minor, you know, so if the E is playing, I could play a D flat minor sort of chord, you know. Okay, so that gives it a different sound than just the straight. Doing the relative chord, which is. So that means all you have to do is make it minor and move it a step and a half backwards. And there you have two chords that are interchangeable. So you should say, wow, I'm going to do this with all the chords that I know. And let's say D, for example. Move it a step and a half back. You have B minor there. So let's see over a D chord, I'm going to play B minor and give you the feel of that. Kind of gives a real pleasant sound, too. It's a little bit different. And if you break into it for just a second out of something normal, it's going to really stand up and give you some attention. The more knowledge that you have, the more control you're going to have. Therefore, the more aggressive you can play, and you can play the notes like you mean it. And it always comes across when a guitar player means what notes he plays, because he really digs in, and you can really tell that he feels it, and he knows what's happening. And uh, so you really want to try to learn as much as you can about the notes that you're choosing, and then you're going to just feel a lot better about which notes you do choose, because you're going to mean it, and you're going to play it like you mean it. It's just going to come out all that much better. And uh, I'm going to use distortion to play, you know, real aggressive stuff, you know, and uh, usually you want to have distortion when you're playing aggressively, so that's what I'm going to do, and you're going to check it out. All the concepts that I talk about, you know, they're going to come through, and you're going to realize that everything that I've been talking about with clean tone and all that, it's all the same. It's all melody. Melody is all you're doing. All you're doing is making music, and you can play it really aggressive. You can play it quietly doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is that you're aware of the notes that you choose.
a lot of guys get caught up with the fact that they think they got to learn these certain scales and be able to play them correctly and uh, these certain scales work only in particular situations and this and that and uh, I never did that and I don't really suggest that it's a great way to do things because that's just going to limit you. The way I kind of developed my own quote unquote scales is I kind of made them up and you can make them up yourself. The way I came up with this one scale which uh, got some name, you know, harmonic minor or something like that. I just heard a chord and I played notes. So I, I came up with something like this over like an A chord. <laughs> I just took one note at a time and said, wow, this note sounds cool here. I tried it like this. No, I didn't like the way that sounded. And I keep, you know, eliminating notes until I got it into a form that I liked. Okay, building on these patterns that you're going to be practicing, you can use them you know, in your scale positions that you've made up, or you can use them in any kind of positions and cram them together in a way that's going to make you sound like you're playing a long flowing run, when actually you know that this long flowing run is like a combination of a bunch of patterns stuck together. And uh, if the patterns aren't exactly the same, then it's going to sound a little bit more interesting and more flowing. If it's all the same, it's going to sound like it's going to sound really obvious to the listener what you're doing. Like if you say, if say you do a straight triplet run, like, and you can like break it up in a way where you don't have to do just one of each. You can do one and one, two of the other, three of one, this and that, and uh, you can make it. To get from one place to the other. So that's a little bit more interesting. And that's kind of how long runs are. I mean, whether they're consciously thought up or not, the long runs, are made up of little patterns which each one should be practiced separately so you're in more of control. That's so important, control. Get control of the notes that you play because uh, that's the only thing you have control over. You know, you can get your technique together but then you gotta have control over your note choice. That's what's gonna make you sound different than someone else because you can control yourself from sounding like someone else. You gotta have control. The key word here is control. <laughs> Now I want to try a progression that's a little bit different in sound and uh, the same concepts apply, you know, following the chords and all that, but let's try to get a different sound from those other ones that we had before. Progression's going to look like this. A minor. D minor. F. And E. So what we have is two minor chords and two major chords. Okay, but it still has this kind of, kind of sorrowful sound going on here. And we want to follow each chord. Of course, we can obviously follow all chords by staying in the key of A minor. We could do that, and that'd be just fine. But that would be like what I was talking about before with like what other guys do all the time. We want to follow each chord to the best of our abilities. So I'm going to give you an example of following these chords, and then I'll start explaining what has gone on. That's so typical of the way I would play. So if anybody cares about the way I would particular play, particularly play, 
to learn exactly what I just did, those are the most common ways that I follow a chord. These chords that we just played, that's just what naturally comes out. And let's start to break that down a little bit. A minor chord comes up. Basically, you can use your notes in your A minor scale or A arpeggio a minor would look like this. Right, that's your basic one, three, five, root, third, and the fifth. And then when the D comes up, I start to get a little bit more adventurous. So D minor happens. And I like to hit this B note over D minor, which has a really exotic sound. So I like to target myself to that D note. So say I'm playing in the A minor part and I'm going. And then I know the D's coming up, so I try to get to a B really quickly. Because I know what's coming up, I know what note I need to hit, so I try to get it somehow. So a D is a real common note for me to hit over that D, I'm sorry, B is a real common note for me to hit over that D minor chord. And also I like to hit F over that, which is like a, it works nicely in the key of D because it's a key, it's a minor note. And it's also nice to go to that note because it's not so great to hit that particular note over A minor. Because if you got A minor going, it's not really nice to sit over that note in A minor. It's nice to pass over it. But it's not really nice to sit on it. But when D minor comes, it's totally great to sit on that note for a while. So that's a fresh note that you haven't really sat on and used up too much in the chord before. So if you think about that, say now it's okay to use that F note and lay on it for a while. That's why I kind of break into that note commonly over a D minor chord. And then the F comes up, the F chord. I think taking that concept one step further, a note that you couldn't use on either chord would be like E flat. Like E flat over A minor would sound like this very pleasant. Over D minor would sound even worse. But if you wait until you get to the F chord, you could play it and pretend, not pretend, just act like you're playing F seventh over there, you know? You can just go, it's like, oh, I meant to hit that weird note. I meant to hit that note there, you know? Basically, it sounds like you're playing a seventh there, because you are. And for the first time in the progression, you can use an E flat. So I like to break out that note because it's fresh then. So I'll commonly go to that E flat there over F and then E comes. There's a lot of different things you can do over a major chord in a minor progression. What I did probably the last couple times when I just improvised was kind of a subliminally throw in a diminished over that. I probably sold like a diminished thing. about a diminished chord if you play it over like E major in this progression three of the notes are going to be perfect like that's like an E seventh the only note that's kind of out there is F over E but if you use it kind of as a passing note it's going to really just sound exotic so when the E comes up So typically I might break into some kind of diminished feel there. So that's just kind of some of the thought processes that happen when I'm playing a progression like that. And that's a really good one to like just tape and loop it for a while and solo over and then get a feel over what the notes are going to sound like over the chords. When you're confident about the notes that you choose, you can just bang, hit them like you're just rip someone's head right off with it, you know. If you're aware of the note, that's all that much more strength you're going to have when you dial into that note, you know. So just be aware and wake up.
I'm going to do something that's real common to my guitar playing, something I've done a lot of times throughout my career. Now I'm going to break that down for you. The chord progression goes C, then E minor, and then for half the time, it's A minor, and then G, then F. That's the whole thing. So the melody looks like this, two, three. arpeggiate with the melody going on, the same chord progression, if I follow each chord, the first one isn't actually an arpeggio, I kind of like took a pentatonic scale and followed it like this. That sounds really nice over our C major chord. For the E minor chord, I went... These things all separately make great exercises, too, to practice and try over different chords and different chord progressions, but I'm just showing you the ones that I used. So that's what I used over the E minor, did that. And for A minor, I went like this. The same pattern, but only once around because it was half the time in the progression, and then comes G. I just did it that way for E's. And for the F one, I followed it like it was an F7, because going back to what I was talking about before, over hitting that seventh note, I can finally use an E flat over, that's what that is, an E flat over the F chord to make it stand out a little bit. Okay, and then I repeated the whole thing. So slowly, I'm gonna play that whole pattern for you. It looks like this. Two, three, four. And so on. That's basically how it goes. Now I'm going to take that chord progression, the C, E minor, A minor, G, F, and I'm just going to solo over it using some variations, breaking into some of those arpeggios like I was doing before, but basically sticking to the theme and the melodic content of it and soloing around it and improvising. And what I'm going to do is first time around, I'm going to have the chord progression playing along first two times around or so, and then I'm going to stop the chord progression and I'm going to keep soloing and you should hear the chord progression through what I'm playing because I'm so much consciously following that chord progression with the notes I choose. Two, three, four. Thank you. 
something that you want to be able to do. So you don't need a backing guitar all the time to solo and practice over progressions. The only thing that matters is the progression that you're playing over as you're soloing. I can't stress the importance of that because that's the whole point of soloing is you're soloing over something and you're an ensemble in a band or whatever playing music. Basically in arpeggios and making arpeggios to follow these chords like in the progression, you know, and to be able to arpeggiate any chord you hear, you just got to know the names of the notes that are in the chord. So you take the first note of the chord or the root and the third, the major or minor third, and the fifth. And say you're taking an A major chord for an example, then you'd have A is the root and C sharp is the major third and uh, E is the fifth. So any place that you can find those three notes in any order, in any position, is your A major arpeggio. I mean, it can look like anything. So without, uh, you know, taking the most obvious ones and simple ones, let's just, you know, come up with a couple off the top of my head and practice those. And let's find, uh, let's find an A here. Okay, those are the three notes right there. A, C sharp, and E. Let's make it a little bit more interesting using only those notes and get something that we can practice as a repeating pattern. Okay, let's try this other arpeggio here. Let's try a C major. And C major has the notes C, E and G in it. So any kind of configuration in and out, up or down of those notes is C major. So let's try it like this. I'm finding that I'd like to have an easier or more interesting way to come down on that arpeggio. So what I'm going to do is come down with a relative chord. You know, I'm going to go up a C major chord. And I'm going to come back down with the relative chord, the relative minor chord, which in this case would be A minor, because C going a step and a half down and changing it to minor makes A minor. So let's take this C and go back down with an A minor arpeggio that looks like this. It's kind of an interesting way to make something that repeats, you know. The whole point is when you practice an exercise that it repeats so you can like gauge your speed on it and your clean, your cleanliness of it by a metronome or something like that. So um, it's got to repeat and it's got to repeat somewhat evenly so you can figure out where the beat's supposed to be in it. So just any kind of thing with an even number is basically easy to start out with. So. That's a good one to do right there. Up C major, back down A minor, and uh, so on. A way to practice that with a metronome is evenly, and the whole point of metronome playing is to develop your evenness, so that's the thing that you want to keep in mind. You already know what the notes are. You're going to play them correctly. Now let's make it really even. So what you want to do is get a metronome speed that's slow enough that you can play it clean and evenly. So let's... Uh, get sort of a metronome sound going here and I'm going to play this lick that I just played along to it.
Okay, so basically what you want to do is get it at a level that's comfortable for you and move it up very gradually. If it seems that you're playing it too fast for yourself, then you should bring it down and don't try to speed it up too quickly. And do this with everything that you know that repeats. Any sequence of notes that you can repeat, you should repeat it with the metronome and get your technique together with that. I think there's a big difference between a player's technique and his creativity. I think technique is like kind of like a bank. You have all this technique in your bank and like when it's time to be creative, you draw from that. And, but you shouldn't use technique as a substitute for creativity. You just have to have this arsenal of shops, you know, and then you can break them out when you need to. But that's what the metronome is for, and that's what repeating riffs and arpeggios and patterns, whatever, that's to develop your technique. An important point is, like, uh, I make up these arpeggios kind of like just because I happen to know where the notes in each chord is, you know. So if I was to come up with something off the top of my head, I know I want C major, so I'm going to hit C, E, and G in any kind of configuration. So let me rattle off a few and see if I can break them down for you. Basically, I went up sort of like this. I started on a low E, like... it easy on myself to get it to this position I went like this from here to a note out of the arpeggio D so sometimes you have to break out a little bit to make the thing smooth and flowing but uh, if you break out smoothly it's cool and it kind of adds to your the motion so I went probably something like this You could, you know, variate that anyway. I mean, anywhere. You could just change it anywhere. When you're up here. So what I did there was I. Picking for me is a very touchy subject because I basically don't really have a clue to what the hell I'm doing. <laughs> I don't have a set pattern that I use over everything, which I kind of like about my playing because then everything I play tends to sound differently. I use a different picking pattern for almost everything I do. So when I play a fast run, it might sound a little bit different from another fast run because I don't alternate pick everything the same or I don't up down and down down up pick everything the same. I have different patterns that suit each lick differently. And, uh, I kind of purposely have done that, and I kind of didn't purposely do that. I just don't like the sound of, you know, some guys have this alternate picking going. They're really good at it, but whenever they break into a fast lick, their run, doesn't matter what the run is, it sounds the same. I mean, they could be playing a completely different passage, different phrase, but the way they pick is going to make it sound exactly the same. So I try not to get any kind of picking patterns that are just going to be the same for everything. So let's take an, as an example that thing that I just did. Okay, here's a right hand, left hand thing where about some kind of moving up and down the neck, you know, I find that I do it quite a bit and I don't really stay in one position. I'll take a, a pattern and I'll move it rather than staying in a box or a position with it. So let's take a little picking pattern and uh, move it around and check it out and see what's going on. Okay, let's break that down and then I'll show you a variation of that. What I did was I took notes that are sort of in an A scale. I didn't really have any strict kind of way to follow any note pattern. I just did what looks easiest for the fingers. And I took a pattern that was like this.
When you want to play fast and you take one simple pattern that's easy to move around, that's basically a good way to do it. And uh, just taking something that's easy in one position and doing it all over the place. This kind of makes sense. And you can make it a little bit more confusing sounding, like by uh, adding a note to each one of these little patterns. Like, say, instead of going, let's go like this. Every other time we'll go, quickly it'll sound like a little bit more interesting sounding. I mean, this is just your basic way to move from one place to the other. Take a pattern that's easy to repeat. Or you can randomly change the riff. Instead of doing it every other time changing it, you can go like this. If you make these things separate, they're going to sound cool and they're going to sound smooth and you can practice them separately. Now the riff goes like this, one of them goes like this. It's just a pattern that stops. And to get a good attack on this type of thing is start it with a downstroke every time. If you do that together without stopping, it's going to be really smooth like this. And then the variation is a lick that goes like this. Now I'll show you how to use that lick in a sentence, if you will, or in a progression. And, uh, kind of basic patterns, moving it around, up and down, like I just did, and how you would apply it into a normal situation. Three, four. Variation is a lick that goes like this. Now I'll show you how to use that lick in a sentence, if you will, or in a progression. And uh, kind of basic patterns, moving it around, up and down, like I just did, and how you would apply it into a normal situation. Three, four. And basically, if you're just playing what's easiest for you to pick, that's, as a rule, the best way to go. And don't think that you have to pick something a particular way. Just because maybe your friend picks it that way. Uh, your hand is, everybody's hands are different. So just do what's easiest as far as picking goes. And there are no rules other than that. You probably noticed that I have a lot of really weird ways to bend notes. And uh, I do. And I think the best thing to do with bending is realize that there's a lot of different ways to bend to a note other than the conventional way that you've been brought up doing. Now, say you want to get to A, that A, chances are you're going to probably go. Right? Now, there's two really obvious other ways to get there. It's from half step behind the note, or maybe even a step and a half. As long as you get the pitch correctly, it doesn't really matter where you bend from. And uh, there's a lot of different ways to phrase a bend in your vibrato and make it sound a particular way. You know. Now, having these 
bends coming from weird notes, it's really nice when you're following a chord progression because that allows you to hit a really strange note for a half a second and really grab the listener's ears. You know what I mean? Say the chord is D. And uh, the note that I decide I want to choose is A. But I hit it from this note. It's got a really attention-grabbing thing. I mean, if you play D and I hit it from here, it's real normal. But if I stop on this note, really going to get your attention because that note for that split second sounds really awful. You know, you've got D and uh, A flat together. Not something you want to hang out on for too long, but uh, if you get into pitch correctly quick enough, it's going to sound really nice. And uh, let's try a lot of different ones. Keeping the chord D, let's take a bunch of different target notes and hit them from strange notes. So that time I went to an F sharp, which is in a D major chord, and I went there from F natural, going from minor to major. And now I'm going to go to the root from a D flat, which is the major seventh. I'm going to go like this. Now let's take a note that's totally illegal and go from like a D sharp and hit an E natural over the key of D. That's kind of tricky because you get to a note that's like still interesting over the chord but you start from a note that's totally hellish. So you can take the D sharp and bend to like even a major third, go all the way from a D sharp to an F sharp and you get something like this. That's really drastic. That's about as drastic as you may want to get. You can take something also like, say, an A flat and go to A. Pleasantly enough. Now, building up into this, let me show you what you want to do with this. You don't want to do this all the time. You want to break into this when you have a target note, the note of choice that you plan to hit. So if the chord is just D strumming constantly, I'll play something normal, and then I'll break into one of these notes. I had all these target notes, and I hit them from notes that are out of the chord, out of the scale, just notes that would sound really horrendous over a D chord. And those are easy enough to find. <laughs> all you have to do is play a chord and play a note that doesn't sound good and bend it until it gets into pitch and just store that into a memory bank in your head and remember where it is and how to get to it. And uh, basically, one at a time, you'll just have this vocabulary of notes that you want to use. Every guitar player on the course of his life runs into the blues progression at some time. And you know what? Whether you like it or hate it, you really have to be able to play it. I mean, there's really few rules in music, but I strongly believe that you have to be able to somewhat play blues. Because you're going to jam with somebody else, and like if you can't play blues, you're just going to sound like you can't play anything at all. Because that's the thing that you should learn from day one. And. Uh, even if it's not the kind of music you like, you should really have an idea of how it works and just what's happening because it kind of really is the basis of rock guitar. I mean, I hate to say it because I'm not really a great blues fan, but uh, 
I think it's a progression that everybody knows, and it's probably the easiest one to hear in your head, like I was talking about hearing something in your head. We all know what chord comes next in the blues progression. And then once you start getting into it, you can like get into substitutions and getting really fancy with the chord changes and all that. But basically, almost instinctively, every musician should sort of know what comes next in a blues pattern. And if you don't, you should start listening, listening to a little blues. Just to do it, you know, just do it because I said do it. One, two, three, four. Just to do it, you know, just do it because I said do it. One, two, three, four. <laughs> That's the way I would do it. Check it out. Mercy. Mercy. <laughs> In that blues, I did a lot of stuff that I explained, you know, the bending from strange notes and the patterns and following chords with arpeggios and target notes and all that stuff. A couple little patterns in there, blues patterns that I do, that I just did. I did something like this, similar to the pattern I did before, but I added a note to it. <laughs> Here's a chord progression that's going to pretty much combine a lot of the factors that I've been talking about, and it's a longer progression, and, you know, when one tends to want to just follow a chord progression with one key or one scale that fits over all chords, you really want to stop and say, well, if I work a little bit harder, I can follow each chord. If I really think, and if I play really slowly, I'll have enough time to change chords with the progression. So let's try a long progression and I'm going to follow each chord really obviously and then I'm going to break it out a little bit and uh, you can watch some of the more advanced ways of following the chords. One, two, three, four. 
four. down and rewind the tape and do it again until you do and I'll see you next time.